Welcome to another Breakaway Rail Talk. Very excited to have this as our fifth edition. And more importantly, we have Vicki Leonard, the managing director of Kick Collective, which is based in Sydney, Australia, and also the founder of Kick Up for Racing. Vicki, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time out to have a, to have a chat with me. Thank you for having me. Um, so give our audience an idea of the genesis of Kick Up Australia and, and your initiatives and, and maybe your, your, your message um, as to you know, why it's so important for our industry. Absolutely. So, I mean, Kick Up came about uh, around, well, uh, the genesis of it started about five or six years ago. I, I was studying for my MBA and being a New Zealander who's now based in Australia, uh, while I was pr- very immersed in the industry, I hadn't really, didn't know a lot of people that weren't in racing, you know, as the industry works, you kind of uh, hang out in your own bubble a lot, of, a lot of the time. And the first sort of large, major experience I had, I guess, of spending quite a significant amount of time with a different demographic was when I was studying for my master's of business. At the time, I was working for Arrowfield Stud, so um, I was ma- marketing manager there, and John Massara is is sort of known globally as a real leader in the racing industry. He he's very proactive in steering the industry, you know, in the right direction. He's the first person that people in Australia look to in a crisis. And uh, I was studying for my masters while I was working at Arrowfield, and and, and came across a, a really unusual situation where, at the time, greyhound racing was actually going through the process of being banned in New South Wales. It la- latterly got overturned. However, what happened was uh, there was a, a very real vitriol towards the racing industry through those conversations. And I was pretty staggered because having lived in the industry bubble since since I'd arrived in Australia, I hadn't really been around this tone of voice before. And the thing that was particularly shocking is that it wasn't like it was, you know, 10 people against, of, of the 50 class, 10 people against 40. It was it was 50 to 1. You know, I was the, the one person who was... Uh, proactive at speaking positively about our industry. And the thing that was really surprising was they were saying, you know, a lot of this greyhound racing um, challenges that they were aligning that very closely to thoroughbred racing. And it simply wasn't true. I went back to Arrowfield and said to John, like, we've got a bit of a problem here. You know, the, this is what the young and quite smart, a very culturally a, a diverse group of people uh, think about horse racing. Now in Australia, racing is very popular. It's not far off being a mainstream sport. And he was shocked. Um, the way that John does, he, he allowed me to gave me a budget to quantify it. We brought in a, a research team who showed that the negative connotations to the sport were getting more and more negative as we went on. And so from there, not long after I set up my own marketing agency, and, and a lot of the, the point there was to, to really go out and be able to work on perception change for our industry and start addressing some of these key questions. Because a lot of these beliefs and a lot of the information that was coming through was simply false. It was based on misinformation, poor assumptions, and nothing that had actually been validated with scientific proof. So that was the genesis of Kick Up, was to actually supply the industry and the industry community with peer-reviewed, fact-checked, scientific paper articles and responses to things that are a little bit tricky and a little bit difficult to understand. And that's where we started, was, was correcting the misinformation that is often put out there about our sport and making sure that we were putting out the right front forward. I mean, we've got a passionate industry of a community that, that loves it, and they can really do the job for us in terms of spreading the word, but they have to be empowered with correct statistics and accurate information. No, exactly. And, and, and that's what we're finding here in the States is that, you know, we're under a similar um, barrage from the general public and from, um, you know, from, from PETA and, and, and other organizations um, about alleging that our industry is cruel and, and unusual and, and it's terrible and that it should be banned just like the way of, of the Greyhound. And one of the things that I loved about your website, um, which is kickup.com.au, is that it starts off, the very first page starts off with falsehoods and things that the mainstream media um, is, is putting out there and actually what the facts are. And I think that's such a wonderful opportunity because it gives you bite size comments to have and they're based in fact exactly and my so my team at kick collective i've got a team of you know 15 young really young people that love the sport 
And what they were finding was come the very popular times of our year in our industry, instead of being able to really celebrate horse racing with their friends, if they weren't immersed in the industry already, they spent their whole day defending it. Mm -hmm. Now, they were more than happy to do that. The problem wasn't the fact that they weren't passionate enough to, to stand up and say, no, you're wrong, and I know you're wrong. The problem was they didn't have accurate, really detailed and, and correct responses to go back to them with. Mm -hmm. So you can get thrown quite an emotional question. It could be, you know, what happens to slow horses? And when you go, well, you know, they're really well taken care of, this happens and that happens, and, and you're talking in vague terms. Okay, yes, right. if somebody knows you very well, they're going to understand the general gist of what you're saying. But if you can go to them and say, well, 36% of horses end up back in the breeding industry, 42% then go into aftercare initiatives that, is, that are structured by the industry to put them into equestrian pursuits, you are going back to them with real information, real data on things that actually matter. And so what happens is you take the emotion out of a lot of these conversations, which for us, those that work in it, that get out of bed at three in the morning to take care of these horses, we are emotional about it and we're very proud of the industry we work in. And so if we can go back to these people and back to the activists, or really importantly, be armed with training going into media interviews or social media discussions, we can start to win the power of voice back and start to change the narrative. Right. And, and how did you go about becoming the voice of Australian racing. Um, because here in, in the States, there are so many splinter groups that all want to comment or nobody wants to comment. Um, and we don't really have a centralized voice. So it, give me an explanation of how you guys actually um, targeted that, that goal and then how you uh, initiated that goal. It wasn't particularly hard to, to, to sort of, I guess, take that goal because nobody really wanted to own it. What's really important, I guess, in the, in the, the way that information is disseminated, it's really important to understand that individuals are far more trusted than brands. Mm -hmm. So if you go and say something or if I go and say something, it's going to mean 10 times more than if the jockey club or if Naira go and put it out there. So we are far more likely to trust an industry if we know someone who works in it or if we have a, even a social media connection to somebody who works in it. So what that means is the individuals going out there and doing the work, the community together, are the ones that are actually going to invoke real change. Now, we need to be empowered and we need to be helped by these key organisations that can disseminate that information to us, can help us get it out there. But ultimately, they if they even try and step up in this space, they're just seen as propaganda machines anyway. So that's right. where the power of the community network really is important. And that's sort of what we started from was that like, it feels a bit like some of the smaller people in our industry don't really have a voice. I know a lot of the big high powered owners also feel in America like they don't have a voice. And this is where we can give them a voice. Now that might be to their 10 closest friends and family, or it might be on a media platform or hopefully more and more and more, because it's the, it's the, you know, the 20 to 30 year olds, particularly females that are mm -hmm. the most suspicious about our sport. They're the ones that we can really start to educate and convince just by opening the doors. You know, what's really important to remember is that, you know, if an industry doesn't share what it's about, people will assume you have something to hide. Mm -hmm. We're a bad mm -hmm. industry for not opening the doors. Now, Price Bell, who's a good, good friend of mine, he had already established the initiative Horse Country, which actually really literally opens the, 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 the gates to the, to the farms of Kentucky and, and right. uh, shows people and invites them in. And that was actually a really important um, segue, how we moved into the American sort of initiative was Price, you know, reached out not long after the, the, the situation at Churchill this year and said, look, I've seen what you're doing with Kick Up in Australia. Our tour leaders, the other connection between a lot of the, the core people in our industry and the public, mm -hmm. but they don't quite have the information. They don't have a lot of these answers. They don't have the confidence in being able to stand up, be proud and defend what, is, what we know are the most pampered animals on the planet. And right. so how do we empower them with the right information to make sure that they can deliver it? And, and yep. that's sort of how we ended up as well, you know, you know, with where we are now, you know, coming into the States with a very similar um, journey on a very similar path to start disseminating this information. Some of it's complicated. Some of it's not easy to understand. We're an industry that likes to use terminology that's alienating to a lot of people. We try and distill that and simplify it, you know, and as a result, because we're a bit complicated, we, we can talk about a great example is two-year-old racing. 
which is often flagged as being, um, you know, a negative. But what is really interesting about two-year-old racing is it's the best thing that you can be doing for soundness in a horse is racing them at two, getting their bones and their muscles accumulated used to that modelling of training and racing. Now, that's a bit of a, you know, something you actually have to educate people on to get their head around. And the best lameness vets in the world, you know, Dr. Larry Bramlage, you know, Dr. Roy, Wayne McElroy, they're based out of the States. They've done so much research on this stuff. And they've got important information that we can be distilling down and sharing in a way that we can say, no, actually, that is complete misnomer. They're not babies as a human would be. You know, mm-hmm. it takes only two years of their life to reach to reach, reach what it takes us 18 years to achieve. So you put those into human terms and we start to distill that down, but with accurate, scientific, real information, we're not going to do the activist approach of just grabbing things out of thin air and, and amplifying it and pretending that's true. We need everything to be validated and properly fact-checked. And so, you know, we've got a great team of vets, you know, without having our back and making sure that that's important and, and being pushed out there. Wonderful, wonderful. No, I think I, I think the, the key is to, to have... Uh, you know, a consistent and fact-based uh, message, you know, for, for the industry to take on some of these misnomers. Let's talk a little bit about um, when you put together uh, the kick up for racing, you had four pillars um, that, that are the base of what you're doing. Let's take them one at a time. And, and, and Vicky will have, you know, uh, on, on the graphics on, on the, on the show. So that way everyone can get an idea of exactly which ones we're talking about. But let's start with the first one, which is addressing misinformation. Yeah. So then that was the catalyst for what became kick up was we were sick of the lies. Um, we were mm-hmm. sick of the fabrication and the, and the, and the, the way that our industry is built, brought down by complete, um, untruths. So the way we tackled that, you can only fight fire with fact. And so we, you know, we went and uh, we surveyed, uh, we had friend focus groups. We found out what were the most pressing common concerns that people had about our industry. And then we sought to go and rectify them. The other thing was we were very clear that if, if our industry was exposed in some way where it wasn't good enough, and, you know, that's, right. that's the challenge we have to face. Our industry isn't perfect. Right. And there's a high risk element and what uh, we ask our equine athletes to do. But they are athletes, and they are treated as such. They are given curated diets that, you know, they're put through, you know, conditioning and athletic programs that treat them as such. So we need to treat them with that respect and start using terminology and data and information as as human athletes are trusted with. So a big part of the addressing misinformation is to demystifying topics that can be misunderstood. Of course, the two-year-old racing is only one example. Our horse is forced to race. Well, we know in the wild that they'll run 10 miles a day by the time they're a week old quite comfortably mm-hmm. alongside their mother. You know, there's a lot of elements that we can dissect and get into here, but we're making sure that, that it's backed by scientific evidence. And so that's the, that's the real key ingredient, I suppose, that's triggered everything around addressing misinformation. Right. And, and, and you mentioned, uh, you know, on the website also, it's not only um, correcting the misinformation, but it's actually having the ammunition to confront it as well, which, which you know, which is something you mentioned here as well. Um, and then the, the second pillar is that, you know, of course, amplify the positive aspects of the industry. Yeah, look, we're an industry has come a long way. And I mean, the activists have a lot to actually be thanked for in this space. I mean, I'm a female. I wouldn't have the vote if it wasn't for activism. And what activism does force us to do is confront, obviously, a dramatic reality. But if we start to move in that direction with proper considered views and with our understanding of how the horse works and what is best for the horse, which is ultimately the number one determination across everything we do, is making sure that what is done, because if it's done in the best interest of the horse, it's done in the best interest of its participants. So. Ultimately, you know, the, the whip rules are an interesting one. I mean, like difficult to defend, right, in a public forum, the fact that we use a whip or a, or a riding crop to encourage our horses. However, if you explain to people what the modern safe whip is made from, cut it open and show them, they start to go, oh, okay, so this isn't the whip that was used in the Kentucky Derby 20 years ago, when yeah, they did come back with marks on their body. You know, this is this has been a, a massive area of progress. Obviously, a big area for, for America at the moment and rapid innovation is screening tools. 
which has been brilliant to see, and it's shown how California has been able to turn their industry around by making sure diagnostics and innovation. So there are the types of topics there that we're just going to put a lens over, make sure that they're amplified and really clearly articulated. Yep. No, excellent. And then we've already spoken a little bit about the third pillar, which is empower the community, having common language and, and talking points. Um, but the fourth pillar, I, I think, is is the most important, and that's accountability. Um, and that has to deal with, you know, calling out bad behavior within our industry. And I think that that's something that usually get, kind of gets swept under the rug. So, you know, give the audience uh, some I, some thoughts about how, you know, we can encourage and enforce accountability. So accountability is not just enforcing our leaders. Obviously, that's the first place to start is to make sure that they're at they're moving and, and adapting with the times and ensuring that our, you know, our athletes and our sport is being positioned in the best way possible. But it's also keeping, you know, each other accountable. It's keeping making sure that, you know, we stop using language like, oh, the jockey slaughtered it or, you know, or he butchered it. You know, that that means a very different thing to somebody walking down the street than it does to us within the industry. Now, that might seem minor, but it sets the tone for a level of professionalism that our industry is probably not renowned for having. Um, so that also making sure that we are doing the best thing by the horse at all times. I loved, you know, I was just recently over, you know, at Kingland November and you know, several of my friends run run major farms in Kentucky. And I loved hearing that, you know, they'd said, oh, you know, we had a few other mares flagged for the sale, but... You know, we just weren't sure whether she was going to end up and ultimately she deserves, you know, a home, a forever home. And then I spoke to a couple of them. I was like, what does that look like for you? And they're like, oh, gosh, we've got all these paddocks in the most beautiful areas of the farm and they are the most well-looked after animals that you'll ever come across. I was like, great, where's your social media content on this? Right. That's what mm -hmm. we need to start showing, you know, go into that paddock and introduce these mares. And and so that's right. the that's the pivot that has come in, you know, and I think that's each other – Keeping, you know, our leaders accountable. It's keeping, if you're an employee, it's keeping your employer accountable, even if it does mean having that awkward conversation about, you know, perhaps not racing a horse at one racetrack because it doesn't have screening tools in place or um, sending a horse to a certain trainer that you know perhaps isn't, you know, uh, run, you know, hasn't quite got the same moral compass that needs to be, our industry needs right. to be kept to account to. So, there's a lot of layers there. The other thing is, is making sure that you, you keep yourself accountable and whether that's mm -hmm. you're a trainer and you need to, to make sure that you are trained in making sure the social media that gets put out about your business is inviting people into all areas of welfare, all animals of how this horse is being treated, or whether you're a jockey, learn how to, to speak to media. There's no better training that you'll get to be an ambassador for our sport than understanding how to have really tricky conversations. Because when you get a microphone thrust, thrust in your face, you know, having asked why we should be still racing and allowing horses to be raced at this, you know, you need to know how to answer those questions. So right, across right. all levels, it's a community initiative, and that's what Kick Up's about and, and, and Light Up now in the States, is all about getting together and keeping each other on track, demystifying, uh, challenging information and making it accessible for all of us to use so that we can stand proud and, and, and push for change where it's needed but articulate our sport better in areas where we know that it's, it is good and doing the right thing. No, excellent. And Vicky, my, my last question is, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to put the initiatives out there. It's another thing to measure them. How do you track your progress? Are, are there specific metrics that you're using or is it just because it's still in the early stages, you know, it, it's hard to, to quantify? Well, in Australia, it's been, it's, we've been going for 12 months. And so we've been able to certainly take a look at key analytics around traffic and, and, and um, engagement. What was really interesting this year, you know, being one year on and, and going through Cup Week at the same time, you know, we noticed that people were visiting the site on average five or six times. So that means that they're coming back and checking their information and making sure that it's correct. Um, but it's also in, in ensuring that um, going forward, uh, we, we do have benchmarking. And what's amazing these days, slightly creepy, but it is incredible, the level of depth with data you can get into. And AI is moving into a really interesting space around um, sentiment, being able to track tone, being able to pick up on issues that may be rising before we've, we've even noticed it becoming an issue. So there's real uh, social measurement. There's There's intelligence now that is evolving at, a, at a quite a rapid rate around um, determining what people are talking about, where they're talking about it, and how we can improve their sentiment of what they're talking about. So that's really important next step as well to get into. 
No, that's, that's extraordinary. Uh, Vicki Leonard, Managing Director of the Kick Collective and also founder of Kick Up for Racing. You can get all this information on kickup.com.au. Um, I've been enlightened and, and really appreciate all your time, Vicki. Um, you know, I can't thank you enough and, and we'd love to have you on again, you know, maybe not in, you know, in, in six months or a year when, when we have some more traction and, and, uh, just keep up the good work and thank you so much to you and your organization for, uh, keeping us in line and, and giving us the ammunition that we need for some of these battles. Yeah, no problem at all. And if anyone's interested in where we're starting, we're in the very, very early stages of getting a similar initiative off the ground in America, and it's called Light Up Racing. So that you know the website's up there, and you can go in and fill in a form to stay in the loop. We're about ten days away from launching the equivalent site um, for Kick Up over here, Light Up Racing, which will have answers to common questions. We just had to refresh a lot of it with American data. Um, and, and different science. But uh, if you have any particular questions you think should be addressed or you have any topics you want to cover off or if you want to get involved, please don't hesitate to jump on, on the website there, lightupracing.com, fill in the form, and um, yeah, we'll keep you in the loop with everything exciting that we've got planned because there's a bit there's a bit ready there. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. No, Vicky, thank you again for your time and, and for everything that you do um, to try to, to position our industry for success for years to come. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you for having me on. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to make sure that you were uh, aware of our most important sponsor for Breakaway Rail Talk, and that's Arian Pedigrees. I can honestly attest to the fact that Arian Pedigrees has some phenomenal, phenomenal reports you know, ranging everything from just a basic pedigree to catalog style reports. And the most important one that I use is the theoretical matings. So that way I can go back four, five, six, even seven generations to see the inbreeding and crosses of my potential hypothetical matings. Um, so again, definitely recommend you go to Arian Pedigrees, which is arian.co.nz. Arian Pedigrees, the way to research.